Hey, brother. Hey, bro. Sorry about the hold up. <laughs> it was just nah, one. Nah, nah. It's my, my computer wouldn't log in, so it's it was a little bit tough. But um, we'll uh, we'll see how this connection goes, bro. Because usually I use my uh, data off my computer, off my laptop, because our home data isn't very good. So if we keep cutting out, we might have to reschedule it, bro. Because I don't know why it won't pick up the data. Come on, bro. Not still on dial up, eh? Wow, we're just above that, so <laughs> we're not too far off. <laughs> oh, anyway, bro, thanks for thanks for jumping on. Um, as as uh, as you're aware, I'm trying to start this podcast and just given the current climate and then it's, uh, most people are at home. I thought it'd be a good time just to catch up on some of the bros uh, and also some of the, our local icons in our community. Now, I'll, I'll just start by saying to everyone listening, the millions listening at home. That uh, when I when I sent the generic message out, Dan's uh, response very humbly to me was, uh, "I don't really consider myself an icon, bro." Um, which I think you've been a bit modest there, bro. So I just ran off a few stats. Uh, Google's done its thing for me. So uh, represented Hawks Bay, the Magpies, thirty plus games. You play, spent a bit of time in the Bay of Plenty. You also uh, played down south, I believe, season with North Otago. Uh, New Zealand Colts, um, New Zealand Mike Youth team, I believe, way back. Uh, and then you yep. played, your, played your trade overseas, Spain and France, uh, you, with a bit of success over there, and also managed a couple of uh, couple of kicks for the Chiefs. Pretty pretty impressive, bro. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think that elevates you to icon status. But anyway, now that your head's uh, <laughs> gone back to normal size, uh, just for everyone that probably doesn't know you, bro. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your upbringing, early life, childhood? Go for it. Oh, yeah. My name's uh, Dan Wanga. I was born in uh, Napier Hospital, actually, when it was uh, still still up uh, up on the top of the hill there. Um, so I had my early childhood in Flaxmere uh, before our family moved up to uh, Auckland for a bit. And then we relocated back to Napier, where my mum's from. Um, I have... Um, four sisters, uh, one brother and a whangai brother. Um, Mum and dad are separated. They separated at a young age. Uh, Hawke's Bay is home, uh, but the East Coast is uh, sort of where my heart's from, Ngāti Poro and Te Whānau Apanui. Um, that's where dad is. Um, and that's where my uh, two of my grandparents are, are born, uh, are buried as well. Um, I'm 34 now. Uh, I'm married uh, to Jamie, and we have four beautiful children: uh, Maya, Riley, uh, Kendall, and Luca. So that's about a little bit of a brief outlining on on me and me as a person. Cool. Thanks, bro. Sports was a big thing. Um, we were never pushed into any type of sport. We were just pushed into doing a sport and just giving it our best crack we could possible. Um, so yeah, it was always about the enjoyment, um, and that's something that I'm trying to pass on to my kids. Although um, the way I'm genetically made up, I uh, I'm a competitor, and I always want the best, um, and sort of push them a little bit too far sometimes. But um, that's just behind closed doors. Um, I do that, um, but generally, just yeah, with with my kids, just try and push them to. Um, to do the best that they possibly can and, and whatever they, they um, choose to do in their lives. Cool. Thanks, bro. Thanks for all that. Um, now, as, as you're aware, I, I was pretty fortunate to play a bit of footy with your old man uh, many moons ago. Um, and I remember, and that's how I first come to meet you and, and your family, basically. And I remember you and your younger brother, Wa. You guys would have been maybe 10 or 12 at the time. You'd always tag along with your old man to trainings and stuff. And I sort of, I just noticed something in both of you uh, then. Uh, just you jumping and play touch. You know, guys' school level was pretty good. I was just like, man, who are these kids? Man, they're going to have a they have a bright future. Um, so I was, and from that time, I kind of followed your guys' progress uh, quite, uh, you know, quite closely because I, you know, I knew your family, I knew your old man. When did you kind of figure, you know, maybe maybe I could make a career out of this? Maybe I could go all right at this rugby thing? Uh, when did you come to sort of that realisation, bro? Um, that realisation of rugby becoming a, a job for me or, or something, you know, that, that could take me uh, down a career path 
was probably I was I wasn't till I was about probably 18 or 19. Um, but my my dad pretty fastly shot that in the foot and um, said there's other things to life and uh, be just a rugby player because um, even you know back then it was still just early days of professionalism. Um, so yeah, so I was I was probably 18 or 19 years old when I thought oh yeah I could. I could have a crack at this and, and make it my full-time job. Cool, Bob. Um, I want to, now for the sake of all the viewers, I don't want to make this a rugby video, but given I'm passionate about it and you've got a pretty extensive rugby background, uh, I want to just talk through, we're going to talk about some of those teams I mentioned earlier, but I want to bring it back to um, that boys high team, particularly that um, 0203 team. Uh, it was a pretty special team and obviously I had a, I had a vested interest because my nephew Jerome played in there. So I followed your guys' progress, um, and I, I and bloody Uncle Google's come through for me. So it's a 2002 season, mate. Uh, 22 game, one 22 out of 24, one draw, one loss. Um, 1,086 points for uh, 185 against, and, and I believe Rickster Munston was somewhere over 300 points. You yourself over 100 points, just. Phenomenal era uh, for schoolboy rugby, bro. And um, what are some of your sort of memories around that team? And why do you think that team was so successful? Um, my memories is, is still, though, that those, those two years were probably my best years of rugby ever. Um, you know, injury-free. Personally, I was injury-free. Um, there was no pressure on us to be, to be, to be performing. Um, we had a good mateship, like, we were a pretty tight um, group of guys, um, and we played it for the fun of it. It was never made like it was a chore, um, and I think that was the key thing for us back then is that, that everything we'd done was fun. Um, even the hard work we'd done was fun, um, and the boys were willing to, to grind it out for each other um, behind closed doors when, when, you know, when we were playing. Um, the boys were willing to do anything for each other, um, and we always had each other's backs. Um, if you found one of us, generally, you found about five or six of us at least. Um, so we we're always together. Um, as much as I shouldn't be saying this, if we were, uh, you know, if we were wagging, there wasn't just one of us wagging. There was five or six of us. So <laughs> if you knew the spots, um, you knew where to find us. Um, but I think that's what it comes down to. We enjoyed each other's company. Um, the coaches made everything fun for us, and we we're willing to just give it all for each other. Yeah, cool, bro. Yeah, and like I said, um, obviously following that team, I, I remember going down to Boys High and just the place would be choked on game day. Like if anyone and everyone would be there just because you guys had kind of just created this mass following because you're so successful. Um, yeah, really cool, bro. Really cool times. I, I've got some fond memories of that uh, myself. And obviously a few... Um, a few notable players come out of those teams. A few guys have made it successful. We've had a couple of All Blacks, some guys that have represented at high levels. So, yeah, really cool period. And I, I doubt if that would be replicated. Um, just the success you guys had, and just um, yeah, the way the way the team operated. So yeah, um, high school, bro. You left high school. You went and played a bit of club footy. You quickly fast tracked into the Hawks Bay team. Um, how was that in terms of? Going from first fifteen to club to you know ITM Cup or it was still uh, I think we were Div Two back then, but uh, we soon mm -hmm. made Div One. How was that transition for you, bro? Um, it was it was difficult um, uh, just being a young fella, um, sort of learning where your place is and where you fit in and how you fit in. Um, especially you know b being a ten as well, you've sort of got a You've got to lead the team around, um, but also being a, a new guy and a young guy, it was sort of, you've got to find that balance right. Um, you've got to get that right balance. But um, lucky enough for me, um, I played club rugby at Tarrata with um, with yourself and a, and a few other legends um, through Hawke's Bay Rugby. And um, Motu, Motu Ngārimu uh, took me under his wing. Um, and, you know, he, he, he chucked a few down my throat one night and said, if you can handle this, I'll look after you for the rest of the year. And um, he, he stood true to his word and to this day, he still looks after me. So, um, you know, guys like that, that, that were older, experienced, um, made you feel a little bit more comfortable in the environment um, and just made things easier for you and, and just to be able to do your job um, 
and just, you know, I think, you know, I was tears in, at, at Teradol and, and with Hawks Bay, I was just told to express myself um, the best way I knew how and, and for me, um, that was the best licence to be able to play sort of off the cuff and um, just play with what, whatever was in front of me. So that's what I pretty much, you know, that's what I enjoyed the most. But, you know, there's some hard times and, and, some, and some good times in there as well. But I, I think most of them uh, were, were great memories, awesome memories. Yeah, you mentioned uh, playing 10. It's probably not a more scrutinised position on the part. Um, and with playing 10 and with playing or any uh, rugby at, at a high level, there's obviously some criticisms, which is inevitable. Um, how, I guess, throughout your whole career, bro, how do you deal with that? Do you even look too much into it? Does it get to you, you know, when you read the papers and stuff like that? Um, how, do you, how did you deal with that part of being a pro footy player, bro? Um, I think the higher level I played, um, the less I try to stay away from media, social media especially, um, and the media. Um, because, you know, sometimes even even as a player in general, not, not just the first five, you... You can have a you can have a really good game, but you do one thing that that just irks someone, um, and then that's all they remember you for. So in terms of that, like you got to be pretty mentally st- uh, mentally strong to be a footy player, I think, because someone's always going to find a flaw in your game. Um, but you just got to, as you get more experience, you learn how to um, filter stuff a little bit better, um, and then take on stuff that you need to take on and and flush out the rest. Now, you had, a, you had a couple stints with Hawke's Bay. You started with the Hawke's Bay. Um, I think you went down south to North Otago. Then you ended up at uh, the other bay, Bay of Plenty. Um, how was that, bro? And how was that set up different? Or was it very different to the Hawke's Bay set up as far as how they ran things, training, uh, team, team environment, all that sort of stuff? Um, yeah, I think the two were very different. For me, um, going to Bay my, my dad's whanau is from as well, um, from Tauranga there. So for me, it was sort of um, a little bit of um, playing for, for my whanau as well, um, which was good. But um, in terms of setup, it was, it was quite a bit different. Um, Bay Plenty didn't have as much, as much coin as, as Hawke's Bay did. So they sort of run on, on the bare minimum. Um, but what they did have, they made good use of. Um, and it was, it was about... It was about the group staying tight. Um, you know, not saying that they didn't have that in Hawke's Bay as well, because, you know, I love Hawke's Bay. Um, it's my home. Um, and I would, you know, I'd do anything to wear that black and white jersey again. But my time in Hawke's Bay, uh, in Bay of Plenty, was special. Um, and it was really player driven up there by the senior players. Um, how it was going to look. Um, so it was, and that's, that's where I really got my first taste of like a senior leadership role in a team. Um, and really enjoyed it uh, and started to realise a bit more of my potential um, through those two years that I had up in Bay of Plenty. So, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the resources there. I think it was, um, I don't know if it was during your time there, but I remember it was pretty well publicised. They were, they were running on the, on the bare minimum, even to the point where guys were um, communal living when you were travelling instead of hotel. I don't know if that was during your time, but I... I do remember that, and I guess that can either really galvanise a team or do the opposite. So it sounds like it's it was a really good environment. Um, just on that Bay of Plenty tenure, bro, you, you come back to haunt the Magpies, and I remember that game quite clearly. You had an absolute blinder. Uh, talk us through that and how it was playing against uh, a province that's so dear to you, mate. Um, it was it was tough because you know being young guy and being me, I'm I think I'm a pretty loyal guy, and and to come to have to actually leave Hawke's Bay to start with, um, you know, that was, that was more of a, that was a business decision rather than um, a personal sort of type decision. Um, but yeah, coming that week leading up to the game was, uh, was pretty exciting, not only for me, but for, uh, for, for Berkey as well, Colin Burke. Um, um, Cause we both, you know, grew up in Hawke's Bay for big chunks of our lives and um it was it was nerve wracking during the week, um, but then coming you know once we got to Hawke's Bay, it was it was pretty exciting. Um, we we're both excited about it, um, and then come game day or come game night, I was just I was just chomping at the bit to get on the field um, just to play against some of the boys that you know that I'd grown up with. Um, 
and even you know at that time there were some some kids that were you know uh, that had come into the Hawks Bay team as well that that um, I could have a crack at as well. So it was you know and what what better way you celebrate um, playing against your old team at home and and you get a victory up against them um, and you know in the dying stages of the game. Yeah, very memorable, bro. Um, so yeah, I guess moving on from 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 Bay of Plenty, you, you or oh, I don't know if it was before then, but you did uh, play a trade overseas. You had a you had a season in Spain, pretty successful season too, mate. A uh, couple of hundred points and a, and a championship. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So after that second Bay of Plenty season, I actually thought about because um, I wasn't I wasn't getting paid a lot at that time, and we just had our our third kid. Um, so I was thinking of hanging up my boots, moving home, and and just just getting a, a full time job again. Um, and O three era, um, Glenn Rolls got on the blower to me and he said, "What are you up to?" And I said, "Oh no, not a lot." And he said, "Mate, we'll we'll pay for you guys to get over here, um, come over a crack in Spain." And I was just thought, "Oh yeah, this could be you know just a bit of a holiday for us, um, and we'll just see what happens of it." And it ended up being. For me, I would still put it down as probably one of the best seasons outside of my uh, school rugby that I had in um, in senior footy. Um, really enjoyed it. These guys played rugby because they loved rugby. Um, they weren't the best skilled players, but they gave it their all, um, and they were willing to learn. Um, we had a, it was quite funny over there because we had a coach that was the probably the worst coach you'd ever have. Um, I sort of. Me and a couple of other foreign boys ended up coaching us on a Saturday, and then we'd talk uh, on a, uh, during the week, and then on a Saturday before the game, the boys would would talk a game plan, and we ended up throughout the season we um, we ended up um, devising our own game plan through game through game time, and um, you ended up winning the competition. And uh, on a personal note, you know, I, got, I think I got. Um, most points in the season and a couple of other records as well. And I think some of them still stand in Spanish rugby. So that's a pretty cool little feat to have. Yeah, I uh, I actually caught a clip of that final um, a few years back. I don't know, it was circling on, on social media. And man, they, were, they looked like a real passionate bunch, the Spanish. Like the crowd was insane um, when you guys won it. I think you've got a probably close to 70 metre try there. Was that in the second half? Back when you were pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I just remember seeing the crowd and just the passion, you know, uh, I, and I didn't, you know, cause obviously that's a big football country. I didn't realize there was that much uh, of a rugby following or the passion from the, from the, from the fans. Well, I think that's, I think, where, I think that's where they get it right. Um, you know, their club scene is, is, um, is the professionals, the professional playing as well. Um, little stadiums, so you've got you've got eight, nine, ten thousand at the stadium, but it's jam packed. There's like you can't get any more people in there. Um, so when you're playing, it feels like it's packed, you know. So that creates that atmosphere. Um, if a stadium feels packed, it's you know there, it always seems like there's more people um, than there is. But um, they, they they just loved you. Like within weeks of being there. Um, this little city where I was was no bigger than Napier, um, and they just everyone knew who you were. Um, everyone was talking about you um, as a, as a rugby player, um, but also in that town they had football, which was a lot more. Um, you know, they they had a which was in the Div Two for for the Spanish Federation. They had handball and basketball in the same city, so rugby was sort of like the fifth or sixth sport. But we still got those supporters that just loved rugby and were there every week, win or lose. Rain or sunshine, they were always there, and they just loved footy, man. And uh, your Spanish, bro? Did you did you get amongst it? Um, how was that with the language barrier? Did you do a bit of Spanish or not really? Oh, uh, we weren't forced to do any Spanish, but just like as I said, I had Glenn Rolls there and a couple other foreign boys that have been there a few years, and they sort of translated everything for me. Uh, by the end of the year that I was there, I could understand a little bit, but couldn't speak bugger all. Um, so, yeah, if someone speaks to me in Spanish now, um, I can I can, I can, can understand them, but to reply back, I'll just talk to you in English. Cool, bro. Um, so following Spain, um, well, how, how far after that was it when you uh, got a contract in France, bro? And how was, and how was that? 
how was that different again? Um, yes, yeah, so I played in Spain um, and then I wanted to come back to New Zealand because my passion for grew over there. Um, so I ended up actually coming back to Hawke's Bay for my second stint <coughs> um, in 2012 and I thought I had a pretty good season but I did have probably two games um, which were pretty average games and it probably cost me getting um, a full-time Super Rugby contract I think when I look back at it. Um, but who who knows? Um, and then from there, I um, after that 2012 season, I signed with uh, Berets in France, um, who were in the top 14 at the time. Um, for them, for for three seasons, um, so I was pretty um, amped to get that um, and get that chance to play against some some legends of the game as well, and some top international players as well. Now. You don't have to tell us, bro, but the French are pretty well known for being pretty well resourced. Um, what what sort of uh, contract were we talking? <laughs> Mate, I wasn't as much as the other guys. I was, you know, I wasn't a superstar in New Zealand, so I was still on the bottom end of, of their scale. Um, but we, we lived a pretty good life, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, eh? Um, now you say we, so obviously you had the, the family over there with you. Um, sort of what were some of the barriers that, that sort of um, that run you into having the family over there, I guess? Um, was Jamie able to work? Um, how, did, how did the work work? Yeah, I suppose like Spain was a little bit of a test run for us. Um, <clears throat> the thing in Spain though was that, that um, you know, the European lifestyle is you don't have a, a girlfriend, a wife or kids until you're sort of mid to late 30s. Um, so a lot of the guys playing footy in Spain were single um, so we got to experience this side that Jamie didn't want to go to France in so she um, she made sure that we had a club that had foreigners that had uh, wives that had other children as well um, that just made her life a little bit easier um, and, and as it was at Barrett's, there was, I think there was about 16 foreigners there at the time. Um, all bar, I think three or four of them were married with kids. Um, so there was a good little hub for, for foreign families. Um, and some of the ladies or some of the, some of the guys had been there sort of six, seven, eight years. Um, so the wives' French was pretty good. Um, and they, they had a pretty close-knit group that... Um, that stuck together, done things together, which made things easier for the for the new partners coming in um, to adjust to foreign life. Um, because, you know, as a rugby player, rugby is rugby. It doesn't matter what language or what country you're playing in, it's all the same. Um, and it's pretty easy to pick it up. Um, so um, in that sense, it was more about making sure my family was okay um, and making sure that they were supported. Um, to start with over there with, with some people that could um, get them get them through and get them by. Um, so I think that worked out pretty well for us. And was there a few Kiwi boys in the team, bro, when you got there? Uh, and if so, did that help? Um, yeah, so there was only there was only one Kiwi guy. His name's uh, Peru Taili. Um, he played down at Otago. He's from Dunedin, um, and he had a wife and, and one child at the time. Um, so he actually played with uh, my brother-in-law Callum down in um, down in Dunedin. So that was sort of a link straight away for us. Cool. Um, <coughs> and then the second year, uh, Brent Evans actually came down from uh, I think it was London Irish. He came down from um, and played a season with us in, in, in France as well. So that was pretty cool to link back up with him because he was one of those guys from that you know that 2002 era at, at Navy Boys High as well. And I do know your French is well was pretty pretty reasonable, bro. Do you still do you still dabble? Do you still um sort of speak a bit or try to, or have you kind of left it in France? Uh, no, no, I still like to have a practice every now and then. And um, there's a few uh, French uh, French cafes around um, around town, and there's quite a few French people actually around town as well. And I run across them, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll just blab out a little bit of French just to see if I've still got it. But it, it was only ever good good enough to to get by it wasn't I couldn't have a very um in-depth conversation like we are now but if I had to I could um I could get by and and you know do what I had to do and is it true the French are quite um snobby in regards if you don't speak it um they, they tend to look at you a bit different is that is that oh. true that's 100% true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
my my first my first day in France, I walked into a shop and I said, "Oh, hey, can you help me out with something?" And she, the 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 lady behind the desk pretended she didn't speak a word of English. Um, and then Barrett's is Barrett's where we were in France is a is a is a city the same size as Napier as well. And um, months, um, I picked up a little bit of French. Um, and I walked into the same shop and um, it was the same lady as the first day I went there who couldn't speak English at the time. Um, and I tried to speak in French and, she, and by then she realised who I was. She realised I was one of the rugby guys. Um, and then next minute she's speaking in fluent English to me. So I was just <laughs> like... <laughs> but um, yeah, that was sort of an experience, you know, where, where you, you get that thing where they, they were more into... They'd help you and speak in English if you tried. Um, if you didn't have it a crack and you just rocked in and just spoke English, then they'd just they'd just ignore you. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool, bro. So um, moving on, well, probably shifting back to um, Super Rugby. You talked earlier about some opportunities that were probably missed uh, in your career to submit a Super Rugby contract, but you were fortunate enough to get a couple of games with the Chiefs. Um, tell us how that came about and what that experience was like, bro. Uh, yeah, so I think that was just by chance, really. Um, you know, I, I, through my career, you know, not backing myself enough, I probably missed a few opportunities where I, I could have maybe picked up a full-time contract, but so bad I didn't, but I did manage to get a couple of caps, which was cool. Um, that actually came across, um, so I just finished our, my season with Hawks Bay, and I just signed with um, with Barrett's, um, and then two weeks after signing with them, the Chiefs had a, um, a massive uh, injury run, um, and they were looking for some players to fill in um, for them. Uh, so Dave Rennie actually called me up randomly. I was just like, oh, who's this? Usually I don't answer the phone when it comes up with a random number on my phone. Um, and for some reason I answered this one, and he said, mate, Dave Rennie here. Um, can you come up and pay for us for a couple of weeks? And I was like, well, I don't see why not. So um, I had to get, I actually had to get it signed off from my French club because um, I was actually contracted to them still in New Zealand. Um, but they gave me the all clear and yeah, so be it. I got to, you know, have a bit of crack at and a bit of a taste of um, some super footy. Cool, bro. And um, the environment, I mean, you're only in there for a shorter period of time, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine pretty different to sort of ITM cup level. Oh, mate, the, the environment um, that I experienced, you know, that's when Chiefs were in that golden era where they'd done that, um, you know, back-to-back -back titles um, and they were going pretty well. Um, to walk into that environment is, is not, not a new guy because I played with and against um, some of the guys that were in the Chiefs. Um, so they were pretty uh, welcoming. But um, just the, profession of the professionalism of the guys, they were just on point. They knew exactly what... Um, they knew their roles to a detail, just the, the, the detail, the, the finer detail um, of everyone's roles around what was happening and, and where everything was going was um, was pretty cool. Um, my first, I think it was my first field training with them, I got chucked in the deep end. So I stayed with Tawera Kubala and Andrew Horrell um, for my time up there. And Hoza, you know, he was he's a Hawks Bay lad as well. He gave me a playbook and he just said, mate, this is pretty much everything. You've got to learn this overnight because tomorrow when we get a field session, if you get it wrong, you'll know about it. <laughs> so I pretty, you know, I, I had a crash course over the night and then, um, you know, the coaches were pretty were pretty stoked with the way I responded. We had, um, I ran 10 for that session um, and I don't think we had one drop ball in a, in a, I think it was in about an hour and a half. Um, so that's massive for, I think, any team to go through an hour and a half of footy with no drop balls. Um, so that was, um, you know, that was probably a high lot of my training time with them. Cool, bro. Uh, now, I promised at the start of this video I wasn't going to be all about rugby, so we, we almost get into the rugby stuff, guys. Um, but you touched on um, injuries and opportunities. Um, I, I definitely, I feel personally that injuries hampered your career uh, to some degree, because you you definitely had a run of them, and it probably um, and there were probably some yeah you know, you'd probably say there were some form things which uh, did or didn't affect you you making higher honours. Um, when those injuries were just seemed like they were coming constantly, and this is not talking the concussion, we'll get to that. Was there a time where you just thought, man, I'm done with this? Uh, 
I had my back injury, that was probably my major one that sort of kept me out of the game for for longer than expected when I was younger. Um, and it's a pretty scary one, you know, like some like with my back injury, at times just a little bit of a background on it. At times there was there was days when I before my operation there I wouldn't be able to feel any of my right leg at all. Um, and I'd have to physically move it with my arm to try and make it walk at times. So that's the extent I was at with that. Um, ended up getting operation, and and you know, like spinal is not something that we just, um, you know, we go and have every day. It's not like that, you know, dislocated shoulder or something. Um, if the surgeon gets this wrong, then potentially you're not going to walk again or feel your legs again. So, um, and and I had that operation at, at I think it was like 20 years old. Um, so that that sort of busted up a lot of my, you know, that that prime. Um, time playing to pick up those contracts um, which is you know for me it, it, now when I look back at it it's it's not a regret it, it happened for a reason and and um, you know and so be it I, st I was still able to enjoy the game that I love and but I'd say that was the biggest one for me and that probably held me back from um, yeah. from from doing a few things as well. And I guess fast forwarding to the sort of the end of your, your rugby career, mate, you you sort of got into a bit of grief with, with concussions and multiple concussions, which ultimately led to you retiring from the game. Is that right? Do you want to just maybe talk us through that and the effect that that had on you, not just from a footy point of view, but from a from a personal point of view, a psychological point of view, effects on your whanau? Because I know that's all encompassing when you're having mm -hmm. head injuries. You want to just talk us through a bit of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think then you know, I had my first I had my first concussion when I was fifteen, and then um, and then uh, playing inside you was tough because it was always you know you're always taking the shots for you. So I took. <laughs> but no, I was, and seriously, I I probably took um, you know there wasn't a lot on concussions back in the day. Um, you know, you got knocked out and you carried on playing and. And no one knew because it's a, it's only an injury that you can you can see personally or you can feel personally. Um, so you know, documented, I ended up having like twenty plus, and I would never recommend um, anyone taking that many knocks and, and carrying on playing without seeing a medical profession. Um, but we fast forward to the sort of end of the back end of my career to the end of my career. Um, so I took a I took a knock. Um, so it started getting my concussion started getting up there, and then um, my second to last knock I took, and there was no head contact, no nothing. It was just from pure impact, um, KO'd, and then I try to I try to let the dog blah blah blah. Um, Ten days later, they I actually took the field again. Um, because I thought I was sweet, um, and due to someone's um, brutality on the field, I stuck at the bottom of a ruck, and a guy came in with an uppercut and then dropped the knee straight into my face. Um, and that was the last game of rugby I ever played. Um, so following following that game, um, you know, I, I had some pretty bad symptoms. Um, oh, car sickness was a big thing, and it's still something that gets me to this day. I I struggle to drive in a car in the passenger seat. Um, makes me feel a little bit nauseous still. Um, so ones that get car, people that get car sick for car sick, like that's sort of what I'm like. Um, whereas, you know, growing up, I wasn't too bad being in that position. Um, like even, you know, just going to see the doctor and things like that, I would just, I would struggle. Um, you know, my head would start spinning. Um, and with that become, you know, I, I suffered from anxiety and depression quite badly. Um, but when I look back on my career, I probably had a little bit of anxiety um, through my career as well, building up, um, just with the pressures that, that I think professional sports puts on people. Um, but then when it comes to the end of something um, and it's not on your terms, I think, I think that's where it hit me the most. Um, and, you know, through that, um, I think I... I could have potentially lost, I, I think, you know, if I'm being honest, I, I could have lost my family as well um, through this ordeal. Um, I've got a, you know, pretty good wife who, who sort of um, has always looked after me um, and she knew, she could see I was struggling. Um, and then, you know, she, she called my dad up and, and he was, within three days, he was in France sort of just making sure that I was all good. Um, so I was in a deep, dark place where I was sleeping like, 20, 22 hours a day, didn't want to be around anyone, couldn't be in a group of more than three people. 
um, and you know I've got four kids, a wife, um, so automatically how hard is life at home for you when you can't be in a group of more than three people, you know. Uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, couldn't be around her crying, um, really, really struggled with would make me like angry um, and you know so there was a lot of things um, that would just that downward spiral where where life starts to get a little bit hard and and um, you just don't give a fuck about what's going on so um, but I managed to pull myself out we moved home which was probably the best thing for me um, and then um, we've always been told a healing place for us is, is where my grandparents are. Um, so I went up there. Um, I done a week tour when I got home with uh, two of my kids and one of my nephews um, up the coast and did a little bit of a bit of self healing, self reflection, um, which for me was a starting process. Which I am today. So. Um, but all, all in all, like I still struggle from a few, a few things. Um, I've got to make sure that I'm still getting enough sleep. Um, I've got this about, you know, it's about a meter, just under a meter in front of me. If I start to get tired, I'll get a black spot in my eye. So that's sort of a trigger for me um, that, that I need to rest a little bit more. Um, I still can't do maximum, you know, output on, on weights. So I still can't do heavy weights. So I still can't do explosive speed. It just, it gets with my head a little bit, but um, are you trying you know, to tell other the, things that I've sorry, mate? Are you trying to tell the viewers you used to be able to do good weights and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Big, bigger than you, anyway, my mate. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that wasn't hard, mate. I had torn rotator cuffs, that's my excuse. Yeah, yeah you know what they say, yeah, good trades and never blames his tools, eh? <laughs> hey, mate, um, that's thanks for that. That's a really good insight into a pretty serious, um. Thing. and you're obviously really passionate about and, and like as far as saying advocate for um, concussions and I guess mental illness and guys making sure they manage those properly uh, which brings us on to uh, kind of what you're up to now refereeing um, how did that come about bro and um, how are you enjoying it well um, you know as a player when when you come across a referee and you think what a referee does I was always just like, I could never, ever do that job. I got massive respect for those guys because they take so much shit. Yeah. Um, but how I, I, I actually fell into it by accident. Uh, guy of Hawkesbury Rugby Football Union, Gary McDonald, um, I actually come across him at, at a, at a um, plant store one day and he sort of hooked me onto it and I, I turned it down for about maybe six or seven weeks in a row and then... Um, Groovy um, finally rang me up and he said, mate, we need you this weekend. And I said, oh, I'll give it a crack. And um, I was actually terrible at it the first the first week. Um, wasn't much better the second. Um, and then I refereed three games that season and I sort of thought, oh, yeah, I could probably do this. Um, and I think, I think the thing that gave me the kickstart to really do it was a phone call from uh, Chris Pollock. Um, he's just like, mate, I've heard good things. And at that stage, I sort of thought, oh, yeah, maybe I'll just see where this goes to. And um, um, I think the biggest difference for me from refereeing in rugby is that of, of taking it with an uh, open mind. And I haven't got those pressures on myself that I did as a, ref as a, as a rugby player. Um, whereas me, it's like I'll put in the effort I can now um, and go as, and push myself as, as far as I possibly can. Um, and then where they say, no, you're not good enough to go to the next level now, I'm, I'm happy with that because... Um, it was more about giving back to the game that gave me so much of my life rather than taking from the game like we do as, as sometimes as players, you know. So with that, bro, you obviously you're not doing any refereeing at the moment. What's the um, What's been the word from NZRFU around, has there been any word? Because you were kind of creeping up the ranks uh, as far as national referees go. So what's what's the plan going forward, bro? Or is there a plan? Run at the moment, like it's just a wait and see, um, just to see how long this thing's gonna last. Um, so at the moment, um, anyone that was on a contract, we've sort of just been told that, you know, it's financially it's hitting everyone. 
Um, so we sort of don't really have a role to play at the moment. Um, but depending if there is some competitions um, later on in the year, there could possibly be a role for us doing something. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all just up in the air. Um, but at this stage, they've disassembled the, um, the national squad. Um, and we'll just see what happens in the coming months. Cool, bro. So, yeah, we've just been touching on your refereeing, which kind of leads me into the next thing around life after footy, bro. Now, you've always come across as a guy that's uh, planned for life after footy. Um, you've got, you know, you guys got a house and you've, you've got kids and, you've, and you're also working. Um, so um, what are some of the things you, was it something you were consciously thinking of around, I mean, the, you know, the life expectancy of a rugby player, if you're lucky, you know, five, ten years, if you're lucky, look after yourself and have a bit of luck on your side. But realistically, it's only a, a finite window. So what were some of the things you were doing while you were playing, while you are making a bit of money to kind of um, set you up for after rugby, bro? Um, I think for me, it was, it was more not what i done. It was more about what the people around um, around me and the people that I trusted gave, giving me the advice. Um, you know, I, I had a guy, Simon West, um, yes, Westy, I, a lot of people will know him. Um, he, you know, back in my early days of playing, he knew exactly how much money I was getting and he could see exactly what I was doing with any young guy that's getting a bit of cash. Um, you know, I was at the pub on a Saturday night and eating takeaways um, during the week, you know, which wasn't the greatest thing for a, a pro athlete. Um, but um, he sort of had a whisper to me in my ear and said, you need to be doing this, this and this. Um, and then at, at 19 years old, I, I bought my first house because of, and I put it down to 100% because of him, um, which helped me set me up for. And then also, you know, I touched on it before at the start of the conversation with, with my old man, I said, oh, I'm going to play footy. And he said, you know, footy is not something that, that's not a job. That's something that you just love doing. Um, so he made me do an apprenticeship um, with joinery. Um, and then my job that I have now working for Laminex, which is selling product to joiners um, to make kitchens uh, predominantly, um, has pretty much, that gave me my job that I have today um, because of that inside knowledge of, of how, um, you know, how they work and things like that. So, um, you know, I put a big thing down to, you know, taking the right advice from from the people that, that you trust the most um, and actually listening to what they say because, as we all know, the older we get, um, some of the things that we do, we, we're like, oh, shit, if I'd have done that now, if I'd have done that back then when I was told to, mm. it would have been a different position I am in now. But, um, yeah, because of those people I surrounded myself in as well, I always sort of thought of the future. Um, and what things were going to look like for us. So, wow, uh, a house at nineteen, bro. That's that's pretty impressive. Uh, there's not too many nineteen-year-olds. Well, you couldn't even get a house now, man. I'd hate to be a nineteen-year-old trying to get a house. But um, yeah, obviously some good um, um, some good experiences and some good um, connections you had there, bro. Uh, obviously helped you out later on in life. Do you think? Um, I know you've been out of the game a while, but do you think there's enough emphasis or education around exactly what we were talking about with players to look at life after footy around investments? Because, I mean, these guys are on big, big money now. Um, but again, it's, it's very finite. Do you think there's enough education around setting themselves up for after footy? I think um, now there's, there's more access to that than there was even when I was playing. Um, and as the years go on, the, the access to that sort of stuff becomes more and more. Um, but there was a gap probably from when I started for about 10 years where um, guys that weren't really uh, switched on about what they were going to do after rugby, um, you can see them and, you know, some of those guys are struggling now um, and especially before me as well. But today I think um, these young kids coming through now have got no excuses to um, come out of the back end of their footy careers and, um, and say, oh, I've got nothing to show for it because... Um, the support that all the the NZRU um, super franchises and even the PUs are, are putting um, to these young guys is um, is pretty um, pretty phenomenal for them, I think. Cool. Uh, now, just just off rugby for a bit, mate. Yeah, we are going to talk something other than rugby. Just um, given the current environment uh, with COVID and everything, how how are you and the family like? 
how's everyone and uh, how's it how's it been what 10 11 days into lockdown how, have you guys been finding it um you going crazy yet what's how's it all been oh mate on a personal level i'd say that the first week was uh, was struggling um, you know, it's been well documented. Um, I, I work for part of Fletcher's, um, so we weren't sure if we were going to get paid after uh, last Friday. Um, but we're just lucky that the government changed their stance on a few things, um, and we're able to access a little bit of a little bit of funding from them. So, um, in that that sense, you know, I've, I'm a little bit old school where I like to try and be the breadwinner um, for the family. Um, and you know, there was there was one point there where where I was where I could I couldn't say that I was going to be that person um, struggling with things. So um, you know we go back to my past. Um, anxiety started to get quite quite high that week. Um, I was really struggling struggling mentally. Um, it was starting to take a bit of a physical toll on my body. Um, but since then things have settled a little bit, um, and you know we're enjoying. Um, um, it does get a little bit tough at times, I'm sure it will for everyone. Um, but I think you know us, we're lucky. We've got we've got a little bit of dirt um, uh, in the back in the back paddock, so you know we're not restricted to a 300 square section or an 800 square section. You know we've got we've got five acres out there to to run around on and and, and muck around with. So um, kids are enjoying it. Um, I'm teaching. You know I'm playing a bit of cricket with the young fella. Um, kicking some goals um, and, you know, for me, I'm just trying to teach myself some other things. So I'm bowling left-handed, batting left-handed and I'm kicking goals left-footed as well. So um, that's just to give the, the young fella a bit of a chance against me, you know. <laughs> but he's, he still wallops me anyway. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's where I think the deeper it goes at the moment, um, we're enjoying it, but I'd, I'd really like for this to uh, be over as uh, as fast as possible. So, and speaking of the lockdown, bro, is there is there one thing or one place uh, that you particularly miss uh, since you've been in lockdown? Um, not, not, not hugely. Um, I just able to go to Rome, you know, like. Um, that's probably it's not something in particular, but just being able to go out and you know go to the park with the kids or or go and get a, a feed somewhere or you know so just just getting out and about is is the thing. But you know and saying that you know I'm not I'm not as I'm not as locked down as, as some other people are. You know so uh, just one other thing, bro. Before we we're going to wrap up soon, but I, and I kind of missed it. I got my notes here that nobody can see, but. Um, now you talked earlier on around early in your career, you're a little bit reckless. Um, and again, that just comes with the territory. Um, you're hitting the piss with the boys quite a lot. And I, and I can remember some of those incidences and in some of the states I've seen you in, but I'm not gonna divulge too much on you, bro. Um, but now, um, I, I think you've mentioned that you, you either, you, you drink very little, if at all. Um, is there, was there a particular, um, time or, or an experience or uh, that happened that led you to just pitch the booze or is it just something that you just thought you needed to do? What's Talk to me about that and your decision to pretty much not drink so much. Oh uh, yeah, so there's there's eight years between um, between Maya and, and, and Riley. Um, so when, when Riley was born, um, <clears throat> At that stage, I was I was doing my apprenticeship. I was uh, working. Um, you know, we had Maya. Um, Jamie was working as well. Um, so my life was busy. I was leaving home at five o'clock, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, and I was getting home at, at nine o'clock at night. Um, Saturday, that was during the week. Saturday, I was um, footy all day, so there was I was no time at home. Sunday, I was in bed, hungover, um, so I didn't really see a Sunday. Um, and then when, when Riley came along, it was a bit of a wake up call really, where it was sort of like, oh, you know, do you, do you want more family time or are you going to be a little bit selfish and, and keep doing what you're doing? And then, you know, potentially, you know, have a, have a family with no dad again, you know? So, um, I decided that if I gave up the piss, it would give me more time at night. Uh, it would give me Sundays to my kids. Um, and then, and then I could take the kids down to the club on a Saturday night as well. And, and you know enjoy a feed or 
um, something in, in the company of the club as well. So that way I was I was two birds in one stone. So um, that was my biggest driver. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just start off and just see where we get to. Um, ended up going eight years with no beer, um, no alcohol at all. Um, and then when we moved back to New Zealand after I'd finished my career, um, I thought I thought I was responsible enough because I was one of those guys that was, if I was one, I was a hundred beers. It wasn't one and go home. <laughs> um, but these days, sort of, um, I can now stop myself and if I'll, I'll have one or two, two maximum um, within the space of the right time so that um, if anything does come up, you know, we've got young kids now, if they need picking up, I can still shoot off and, and do what I, what, I, what I need to do um, rather than having an excuse to, you know, potentially uh, have to drink, drink drive. Cool, bro. That's, uh, that's admirable, mate. Uh, yeah, really cool. Well, bro, I'm just going to, we're going to wrap this up and just th thanks for your time, bro. But um, it's not like I've got anything else to do, surely, you know. <laughs> uh, but I've just got a couple of little uh, quick fire questions. I just want to um, just get to know you a bit better for those that don't. Uh, and yeah, sorry, some of them are rugby related. But anyway, so uh, we're talking one rep maxes here, bro. So how many bench? One rep max uh, 155. bench? 155. 155. Remember, we this is an honest and factual interview, eh? Okay. This, this, this was is this is this over my whole lifetime, or is this currently? Life. No, whole okay. life. One fifty-five. Nice. Uh, squat. Uh, it was one ninety, and that's when I ruined my back. Nice deadlift. Uh, it was that? It wasn't much. About one sixty. Okay. Uh, best yo-yo. Best yo-yo, 21.2. Uh, best beep? Beep test? Best beep uh, was 15.7, I think it was. Nice. Uh, best bronco? Best bronco, mate? Sorry, you cut out. Oh, best bronco, 440. 440, okay. Uh, Pre-match meal was a Fave go to uh, to load up before a game. Uh, four toast, can of baked beans, and four poached eggs. Mate, it's almost identical to mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, best player that you've played alongside? Oh, there's probably too many to name. Um, you can, you can, you can, you can have a couple if you want, and don't say me, God. <laughs> um, but someone I looked up to, uh, French French halfback Gash Billy. Nice. Uh, toughest opponent played against? Um, there's plenty of them, um, but Moo, excellent. Sorry, mate, missed that. Cut out. Who was that? Your toughest player? Uh, Moo, he was an uh, ex Hawks Bay captain. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, worst roommate? <coughs> Chris Eden. What, what was that? Worst roommate. Worst roommate? Yeah. Oh. I don't know because I always just sleep so it doesn't worry me. <laughs> uh, Favourite rugby ground, right? Favourite rugby ground would have been uh, Rotorua Stadium um, when it was at its best. Okay, and uh, favourite, I don't know, there's probably a lot, but this rugby memory that stands out for you, mate? Um, rugby memory that stands out would, um, I, I think would have to be my, um, you know, there's plenty, but one that really stands out for me is my first year playing um, for Hawks Bay. Nice. Well, awesome, bro. Thanks for jumping on and giving me some time and uh, giving everyone a bit of an insight into what you're up to now, some of your footy stuff. Um, yeah, keep safe, bro. Stay well. Uh, give my regards to um, Jamie and the kids, mate, and uh, hopefully see you once all this thing's over, bro. Yeah, no, we'll definitely catch up. Thanks, bro, and it's been a pleasure, and you make sure that you guys are looking after yourselves as well. Will do, bro. Thanks, bro. Cheers, bro.